The gang push Dave to the ground and he tries to alert Jack that there's an issue, but it's too late. He's pulled out of the train. He tries to put up a fight, but one of the men swings the leather baton to his head and he falls down in an instant, mm. like the lights just being switched off. Welcome to the Compendium, an assembly of cunning minds, masked identities, and stolen treasures that would spark a series of TV and film adaptations, songs from Phil Collins and the Sex Pistols, and a manhunt that would span almost four decades. Well, that's a clue, isn't it? It is. Do you know what it is? Um, no idea. No idea? No way. So there's hidden treasure. That piqued my interest. Is it another treasure hunt? Well, not quite. This is all about a heist. This is the great British train robbery. Oh, see, I always thought the great British or the great train robbery was like an American Western thing. I didn't know it was British. I'll go into all the details in just a bit. But if you're just tuning in, I am Adam Cox, the captain for this week, that will be inviting you all aboard this tale, which turns 60 years old today. 60 years old? It's happy great British train anniversary. Anniversary day? Yeah. Well, today is also another anniversary. Not an anniversary, but another milestone for us. Yeah. Because this is our 20th episode. It is, yes. And they said we'd never last. I know, 20 episodes. We did pretty good. We have. It's a lot of hard work, but it's a labour of love, isn't it? It is, yes. But I'm enjoying it. And it's great that I'm getting to do our 20th episode. Oh, so you stole, you planned this. I did, I did. A big milestone that you robbed from me. (laughs) Would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, yeah. I'm your co-host for today, Kyle Reesey, and you are listening to The Compendium, an assembly of fascinating and intriguing things. We are a weekly variety podcast where I ordinarily tell Adam Cox all about a topic I think we'll find both fascinating and intriguing. But this week, I guess you're in the driving seat. I am indeed. Let's get going. All right. So in today's episode, we will step back in time to 60 years ago today, where we will retell the real life Ocean's Eleven Guy Ritchie style saga that gripped a nation and sparked a global manhunt. We will uncover which notorious of London's criminals at that time led the robbery, the heist's execution and the downfall of those involved. This is the story of the Great British Train Robbery one of the most infamous heists in human history. In human history? That's a big claim to make. Well, I don't know of any heists in animal history, like in the cat world. Yeah, but it's, you're making it sound like it's one of, I don't know, it just sounds a bit a bit grand for a heist. Well, it is. It's, one of, it's the great British train robbery. It's got great in it. Okay, <laughs> let's get going. Okay, so in the early hours of 8th of August, 1963, A Royal Mail train made up of 12 carriages is on its usual nighttime journey from Glasgow to London. On board the train are 72 post office staff going about their normal work routine and sorting packages and mail throughout the night. The second carriage after the engine was the high value package coach. That's where all the gold is. Yep, that's where they would store large sums of money and anything valuable. But on this particular day, it was carrying a larger sum of money than normal. It was carrying approximately £2.6 million, which is the equivalent of £69 million in today's money. Ooh, 1960s money. I need yeah. me some of that. Yeah, it's, it's tasty sum, that. It was no coincidence that a gang of 15 men would choose this night to take control of the train and steal virtually all the money on board, all within the space of half an hour. So let's start with our motley crew and learn a little bit about the masterminds of the robbery. Okay, let's do it. I feel for this bit, I need some kind of like, um, you know, in like a a heist movie or a Guy Ritchie movie, they have some like music as they introduce the characters with a montage of their life history. I've got the perfect sound clip. Go for it. That didn't sound like it. No, is that not what you had in mind? No, but picture what I said as I go through this. Okay, we might have to cut that bit out then. Okay. So, meet Bruce Reynolds. He is a seasoned criminal with a history of petty crimes. 
He's already found himself behind bars in Wandsworth Prison. He goes on to become an antique stealer, but cannot resist the thrill and the opportunities that comes with being a thief. Reynolds rose to prominence as the leader of the London-based Southwest Gang. His partner in life is a lady called Franny, and they have a child called Nick. Mm-hmm. Some of his most notable escapades in his early criminal career include stopping a security van whilst posing as a construction worker. On another occasion, he steals from the safe of a jeweller's in Piccadilly, which leads to a chase on the rooftops of London where he makes a dramatic escape through a opera singer's penthouse. Okay. However, Reynolds' most defining role came as one of the masterminds behind the train robbery, leading the very gang that executed the daring heist. Mm Mm-hmm. Next, we meet Ronald Biggs, who is more commonly known as Ronnie Biggs. He was in the RAF, uh, but that came to an end when he was dishonorably discharged due to desertion. That's a tongue twister. Does desertion mean like he he just ran away? Like he essentially went AWOL? He, yeah, he didn't. He just ran away from the army. Why? And, um, I don't know. This is just the compendium, Kyle. We don't go into. We just scratch the surface of the details. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know the story. Anyway, so he commits a series of crimes, including car theft, attempted robbery at bookmakers, and he finds himself in Wandsworth Prison, where he crosses path with Bruce Reynolds. Mm-hmm. Following his third prison sentence, Biggs aspires to turn over a new leaf, and he starts a family and he pursues a career as a carpenter. Biggs is in need of money for a deposit to put on a house, and it's around this time that he's working on a particular house for a particular man who just so happens to be a retiring train driver. We'll come back to that. Next up is Gordon Goody. He is another member of Reynolds' Southwest gang. Goody assumes a pivotal role as Reynolds' trusted right-hand man, serving as the deputy and the chief organiser of the great train robbery. Now, in the bold move, dressed in matching attire suits, bowler hats and sporting Charlie Chaplin (laughs) moustaches, Which, I don't know if that's a disguise that would go down. I mean, it doesn't go down well today. I can't imagine it went down that well in the 1960s. No, because that was well off the war anyway, right? Yeah. And when was Charlie Chapman around? Charlie Chapman was like... 40s or 20s? I don't know. It must have been before Hitler, that's for sure. Yeah. Because I imagine after Hitler, that moustache went downhill real quick as a trend. (laughs) Yeah, you haven't seen anyone since, really, have you? Not unless it's a joke. No, and then it's not really a joke. But anyway, they, dressed in these disguises, managed to pull off a heist robbing a wage van at Heathrow Airport in 1962. So Goody and Reynolds and the gang managed to successfully carry off that heist. And the haul that they managed to steal is around about £62,000, which is about one and a half million now. And so they're really disappointed with this amount of money because that's not enough to retire on. I think once they split it out, it's about four grand, which is worth a hundred grand mm-hmm. in today's money. Mm-hmm. So they need to find another job. Um, but what happened to Goody was that he was picked up by the police along with another member of the gang. And they managed to hire a team that was probably slightly crooked. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the solicitors was a guy called Brian Field and he helped them get acquitted. Okay. We'll come back to Brian. We'll put a pin in that. We'll put a pin in him. So what isn't common knowledge at this time before the Great British Train Robbery was there's actually two previous attempts by the gang to steal money. One they had to call off because I think something went wrong. And another time they only managed to like steal £700. Oh, really? Yeah. One, that's definitely not enough to retire on. No. So it's, it hasn't gone too well for them so far but no. so that, that's why they need this next big job to work out and they can then retire and go hide and mm. live their life on a luxury island or whatever so on june the 10th in 1963 after an extensive search for leads reynolds finally receives a breakthrough brian field the man on their defense team approaches goody with some vital information concerning a mysterious individual known as the ulsterman Ooh. The Ulsterman. Ulsterman. Acting as an intermediary between the two parties, Brian sets up a meeting. So at this stage, little is known about the Ulsterman, except that he hails from Northern Ireland and he possesses a distinct accent. So the Ulsterman gets Goody excited with an intriguing revelation concerning the travelling post office. So that was a train responsible for transporting vast sums of money from banks across the country to London. Within one of its carriages, hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of pounds, these banknotes are regularly transported throughout the country. Mm -hmm. So in a stroke of luck, 
the Ulsterman discloses that in two months' time, following a bank holiday, the train is slated to carry an unusually substantial amount of cash on its journey from Glasgow to London. What's more, on this particular day, in two months' time, the high-value package vehicle, the high-security carriage, Mm. is going to be out of commission because it's going through some routine safety. And so it would be replaced by a regular carriage. Oh, less secure. Exactly. So that would make it a lot easier. How do they know this, though? Surely you wouldn't be publicising, oh, yeah, our big old high-security carriage is going to be out of action. So... Well, that's one How of... How they get that information? Well, this is the Ulsterman. So that's one of the... Um, we'll go on to who we think the Ulsterman is. Oh, a an little. insider. Oh, yeah. Well, there we go. Oh. <laughs> well, to know this kind of knowledge, you'd have to be, you know, quite close to the post office. Yeah, you? for sure. So with the prospect of this life-changing amount of money, Goody and Reynolds find themselves presented with this long-awaited opportunity. In exchange for a cut of the money, the Ulsterman provides further specifics regarding the train, the timetable, the operational procedures and everything like that. However, to pull this off, it would require an enormous amount of effort, especially as they would need to meticulously plan the robbery and devise a long-term escape strategy, all within a window of about two months. Right. Okay. So it's tight. This needs to be well planned. Well, yeah, you've you've got to try and pull off this heist in, in less than two months. Mm. I I find it difficult to plan a holiday in less than two months. Well, that's not true. No, it's not true. I would find it hard to plan a holiday (laughs) in two months. I'd be like, I can't deal with this. You do it, Adam. That's usually what happens, isn't it, to be fair. Um, So two weeks later, at Euston train station, Goody dons a a porter's uniform and discreetly manoeuvres a trolley of suitcases through the bustling terminal, trying to kind of, well, carry out a recce, essentially, of the train, how he thinks they're going to get on board. He spots a post office worker and he skillfully engages in conversation, Mm -hmm. extracting valuable information about the mail sorting and the processes during the journey. Well, so he's like, hey, mate, um, yeah, how does it all work? And he was just like, let me tell you. I know, it's quite loose lipped. Yeah. I would have thought he must have been quite the schmoozers to be able to kind of get him comfortable enough to talk. Possibly. Maybe some people are just really proud to talk about their work, aren't they? Yeah, I guess so. I guess at the time, the Royal Mail is probably quite a big institution, right? Mm. So someone going, oh, yeah, I wonder how like the mail gets from here to here. How does all the sorting work? Yeah, and he's like, well, let me show you. (laughs) Interesting. So this is really useful for Goody. And with this information, it helps the plan come together in his head. He works out he probably needs about eight men. But what he does realise is that taking the money off the train isn't probably going to be the issue. Uh, it's more of a case of where they're going to be able to do that. They can't do it in a train station. There's going to be you know, too many guards around mm-hmm. it. It's not discreet enough. So the only way to do it is once the train is moving throughout the country. Mm-hmm. But then how do you stop a moving train? Oh, do you think that this is going to be like, do you remember Breaking Bad when they stole all that, um, that petrochemical thing from off the back of the train and they pretend like a a van had gotten stuck on the track and it stopped. And then while they were trying to move the van, that's when they offloaded everything. Well, interesting you say that. It's not quite as advanced as that. <laughs> but we'll, we'll go into the details. But yes, there is there's a cunning plan, definitely, that you'll, that you'll learn about. Interesting. So Goody and Reynolds, they start to put their crew together. Uh, and they're conscious of keeping the team to a minimum Because they don't want word to get out. This is a very top secret mission. And also more men involved means more money that they have to split. Mm -hmm. So other members of their crew include a guy called Charles Wilson. He's been working with Goody and Reynolds since 1960. And he was also involved actually in the airport robbery. So he's quite well trusted. He would go on to help Goody with the organizing as well as be the treasurer. So he was responsible for dealing out people's money. So um, that was quite interesting, I thought, because they... Like this one man's responsibility is cutting the money equally. Well, I guess like he maybe is a trusted third party that isn't going to stiff anyone over. Everyone likes him. He gets on with everyone. Probably, I bet that's the kind of character that he is. That makes sense, actually. Yeah, I did wonder about that. But yeah, that's a good, good summary, I'd say. Then, of course, we have Brian Field, the man who introduced the Ulsterman to Goody and Reynolds. But he also plays a key part in arranging the gang's escape and he helps purchase the hideout, which would become Leverslade Farm, an abandoned old farm not too far from where the heist would take place. And this is where the gang would lay low and 
yeah, Brian's role was to help do the cleanup, essentially. Mm -hmm. Next is Ronald Edwards, an ex-boxer, club owner and small-time crook. Well, this really is like a film by Guy Ritchie, isn't it? I can really picture it. Yeah. That's why I said cue the music in your head. Mm. Um, So this guy, Ronald Edwards, the boxer, he already knew Goody and Reynolds and had been involved in the Heathrow heist, but managed to escape arrest. He would help assist with the organisation on the train heist. Next, we have Roy James. He was nicknamed Weasel. His responsibility Mm -hmm. was the getaway driver, which, you know, appropriately named. And then keeping it in the family um, was a guy called John Daly. He was the brother-in-law of Reynolds and was responsible in stopping the train and also one of the getaway drivers. Oh, so they do stop the train. Well, we'll come on to that. Okay. So Goody and Reynolds had a solid team, but they still lacked the experience and knowledge of stopping a moving train. So they have to reluctantly open up their plan to a man called Roger Cordry. Now, he was the leader of a rival gang called the South Coast Raiders, and he had experience with robbing trains before. Now, he was brought on board with his men, who were largely the muscle to help move the loot, because there's a lot of bags that they have to move in a very short space of time. He's brought on board because he has, um, and I use air quotes here, uh, an electronics expert. From the 60s? What yeah. kind of electronics expert would you be in the 60s? Well, he had the cunning plan of how to stop the train, which, um, okay. yeah, we'll come back to that. With this expanded team now in place, they hatch out the rest of the plan and determine a piece of track where they can stop the train not too far from London. But the spot isn't the best for unloading goods off a train, and so it dawns on them they're going to need someone to move the train. Mm-hmm. So they're going to have to disconnect the engine and the high-value package goods vehicle then they're going to drive the high value package vehicle a little bit further down the track mm-hmm. somewhere where they can easily offload it and then make their quick getaway. Right, I see. That's the plan. Whilst they're thinking of options, they consider just using the driver of the train on the night because surely he knows how to drive the train. But there is a risk that he refuses to do it and mm-hmm. then it could all go wrong. And so they're like, no, we need a backup. Q Ronnie Biggs. Now remember, he was the guy that Reynolds met in prison Mm -hmm. and he had, you know, quit life of crime, became a carpenter and then met this guy called Pop who was a retiring train driver. Right. So he was somehow learned about the plan and then brought Pop in to say, yeah, I know a guy who can do this and helped basically elbow his way into this plan essentially. It's always good to know someone who knows a guy. (laughs) Yeah. But he he wasn't responsible for anything other than just bringing in this guy. Mm Mm-hmm. That was wow. it. That's but he wanted, he yeah, and he wanted like an equal share as well, considering he didn't really do much. And does he get that equal share? He does. He does. Yeah. Ooh. Well, sounds like some sounds like foreshadowing there. Um, yeah, he's well. We'll come on to that. There's a lot we've got to come on to still. Well, there is. It's a, it's a big story. Okay, let's do it. So the team is now fully formed. They've got everyone in place. All right. So who we got? So we got Briggs. We got Biggs. the. Biggs, we've got the Omniston man. Alsterman. We've got this new, we've got the weasel. He's the driver. Yep. Who else we got? Reynolds, the main guy. Yep, of course. Goody, his operational right-hand man. Uh-huh. Then a few other people, which aren't really that. It's quite a lot of people that we've got to split this money through. And I guess not everyone is getting an equal share. You're right. There's now 17 key people involved. So what went from a relatively small team has expanded three times pretty much. Yeah. And um, there are a few other people that they need to divvy that perhaps get a smaller cut. They call them drinks, basically. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, so why, why are they called drinks? I don't know. Okay. Um, but they perhaps would just get 10 grand helping do some part of the plan, but not really involved. They're in- like contractors, right? Yeah, associates. Mm. So it's decided that the gang need a place to hide out, especially once they've done this massive heist. They know they're going to get a lot of attention. They need to lay low. So Brian Field comes to the gang's aid and he secures the deserted Leatherslade farm as Mm -hmm. their hideout. Mm -hmm. The team agrees to lie low and divide the money there. They then equip the place with enough food to last the crew for perhaps several weeks, along with cards and board games to help pass the time. For seven weeks? Several weeks, sorry. Even still, several weeks? Like three weeks, let's say. That's a long time just be hiding out Mm. with a bunch of boys. (laughs) Smelly boys. Hey. Um, well, I can't imagine. I imagine some of these men might be smelly. It was the 60s. Did you have deodorant back then? I'm sure you did. I don't know. Like, 
Your not 20, parents would have been born in the 60s. Surely not 24-hour protection or 72-hour protection, what you get now, which definitely doesn't last 72 hours. No, especially what we bought recently. I'm sure they've changed the recipe of some kind because the, this last couple of weeks, I've been fresh. I think, one, it's warmer, but two, it's no longer from Russia. Remember, a lot of our deodorant used to come from Russia. Are you kidding me? No. Really? How do you know that? My dad. And so, so because of obviously what's happening in... Ukraine, we mm. are now have a we have a lack of Russian deodorant. You're yeah. talking like sure deodorant, right? Twenty four hour protection. I guess so. I think it's more like stick and stuff like that that maybe is impacted. But I know they had to um, move their work to other factories, like in Spain or somewhere else. Wow, the more you know, hey. Mm. That's why I'm stinky. I've got the I've got the Russians to thank for being all fresh. <laughs> um, yeah, that's okay. Back to it. Back to the story at hand. So the plan is in motion and everything is set. The crew faces a daunting task, stopping a moving train, seizing control, relocating it, unloading the money bags and making a clean getaway all within half an hour. Sounds simple, doesn't it? It does. If you're if you are driven by the idea of being alone with a bunch of men for three weeks, then yeah, you could do anything. I think it's the money. That's what's driving these people. Oh, yeah. And the money. Yeah. right. If all the stars align then Biggs, Reynolds, Goody and the rest of the team will orchestrate one of the most monumental heists in history, amassing a nice 150 grand each, which is about 4 million in today's money. Wow. So just a few days before the heist, Goody and Reynolds conduct a final check and encounter an unexpected issue. Their car is not suited for the back roads and country lanes of the UK, particularly if you need to make a clean getaway. What are they driving? They're driving one of those like three-wheeled Robin Reliant things. <laughs> I'm guessing something that just maybe doesn't handle well around corners and cars were different back then as well. Sure. So they need a new car then. Yeah. So time is running out. They don't quite know what to do. Hang um, on. So I thought Weasel was responsible for the getaway. Yeah. So they've hired someone to do the getaway driving and he's not even brought his own vehicle. It's yeah. like... Me hiring a carpenter and him coming along going, hey, yeah, um, you need to supply the wood and, yeah, the tools. That's a good point. And surely you would want the weasel to bring his own car because then it would be a car that he is used to driving, right? I've never stole anything like this before. So you wouldn't know? I wouldn't know. Anyway, so the time is running out and the team must act pretty quick. But fortunately, on one of their final recce's, they realise that they're close to an army base. Mm -hmm. And that army base has army vehicles. And they're much more suited to the back roads. They certainly are. So they manage to creep up to the army base and steal a couple of Land Rovers. And that's what they would use as their getaway vehicles. Perfect. That's a perfect vehicle. That's what you need. Yeah, exactly. So that was pretty fortunate. So things are working out for them so far. Meanwhile... Over in Glasgow, the post office train embarks on its fateful voyage towards London. With each passing moment, the weight of anticipation intensifies. The dice has been rolled and there's no turning back. In the eerie darkness of the British countryside, the time draws closer to 3am on August the 8th, 1963. Amidst the stillness, a seemingly innocuous Royal Mail freight train steadily trudges along its nocturnal path. It's very poetic, Adam. I know. I'm building a picture here. Oblivious to the impending events about to unfold, the weary postal workers aboard are already several hours into their arduous shift. The train driver is 58-year-old Jack Mills. He is supported by his co-driver, a man named Dave Whitby. Dave is also tired and he's ready for this long journey to be over. However, he's a professional and he's used to doing this route several times before. Peering into the darkness... Dave spots a red light glowing down the track. This instantly confuses Dave and Jack because they know the stretch of track and there's never normally a red light here. Usually they can just, you know, fly through it. No problems. This really confuses them. Plus, What's the red light then? Well, the red light's telling them to stop. Oh, I see. I thought you meant like a train was coming head on. But no, it's just an actual, just a red light. That's right. Yeah. So normally there'd be a green light to say, yep, continue proceeding through. I see. But they see see a red light and they're like, oh, this is weird. Mm. Um, So no one's alerted to Dave and Jack that there'd be a hold up or anything down the line because normally that's what would happen. Mm -hmm. So 
obviously abiding by the red light, they start to slow the train down. It draws to a halt at Sears Crossing in Buckinghamshire. Mm -hmm. They wait a little while before they make any decisions because they think perhaps the light's just going to change. But conscious that they need to be at their destination on time, Dave climbs out of the train to see what could be the holdup. He starts to approach the signal. Right. As Dave draws closer to the red light, Dave spots a faint glow of green coming from the same area. Dave's vision is trying to adjust, essentially, like, what what am I actually looking at Uh here? Uh But quickly, he realises that the faint green glow that he can see is coming from the signal, and something has been placed over it. What is it? He finds a thick glove covering the majority of the signal. Just a glove? A glove. Like a man's glove? That's right. Now, remember, what does that mean? Well, remember Goody and Reynolds had to recruit Roger Cordry because he knew how to stop a train. Y- yeah? Well, this was his bright idea. Shut up. <laughs> and shut up. <laughs> yes. A glove had been placed over the green light. And so, yeah, he's not quite the genius you think he was. I mean, that's like hiring someone from mybuilder.com to do a DIY job. And then you realize, oh, you just wasted 200 quid. I could have done that. Well, that kind of did happen to us. We've all we've all been there. Exactly. Shit. <laughs> in fact, in one of the follow-up interviews that happens much later, Goody actually admits if they'd known it was going to be as easy as that, they would have never had hired him whatsoever. And does it work? Well, it does. They managed to stop the train, didn't they? So he did know what he was talking about then. He's not just a fool. Um, he's not just a fool. He's perhaps just massaged his skill set. But it stopped the train. It, it did. Sometimes yeah. the most simplest things, right? True. I mean, he did say that he could stop a train and he did do that. Dave quickly realised something is amiss. Is this a trap? He inspects the signal unit where the wires have been exposed and he quickly sees the signal's been tampered with. He checks for other signs to see what else is amiss and he finds some wires that are... Well, they've been added to the signal box. So he follows the trail of those wires to an external battery. And you can see this battery is being used to turn on the red light. Mm -hmm. So maybe that part is quite clever, actually, Roger. Maybe you are a good... You calling me Roger? Not you, Roger. Roger Cordery. Oh, it's just that you look at me (laughs) in the eye. I'm like, hello. (laughs) But yeah, Roger, this was a good idea. Powering the red light. Dave knows he needs to report this and fast. So he looks around to see if anyone is about, but he can't make out much in the darkness. He finds the phone box along the line and picks up the handset. Mm -hmm. The line is dead. He checks the back of the box and finds the wires have been cut. He turns back to the train and starts to run when he's ambushed by several men. Okay. He counts maybe 10 men. They're emerging from the darkness armed with these leather covered batons. Uh Now it's important to note here these batons were a conscious choice by the gang because they didn't want to carry firearms for this robbery as they knew if they did get caught, then they would serve a much longer sentence for an armed robbery. Sure. You could argue that they perhaps didn't intend to cause serious harm to anyone if you've got one of these rather than a gun, maybe. Depends on many times you hit someone with it. It's true. I mean, you could do, but I don't know. Maybe there's an argument there. The gang push Dave to the ground and he tries to alert Jack that there's an issue, but it's too late. He's pulled out of the train. He tries to put up a fight and he perhaps should have cooperated because one of the men swings the leather baton to his head and he falls down in an instant, like the lights just being switched off. Yeah, he's out. Dave panics. He tries to break three, but being held down, he only manages so far before he loses his balance. He stumbles and rolls down the mound, tumbling until everything goes black. So he's out. Yeah. The gang board the train. Pop, the crooked driver that Biggs Mm -hmm. brought on board, takes a quick look at the controls and quickly realises... Oh, God. He doesn't know this train. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, no. He's like, "Uh, this is a different model to what I drive. I can't do this. This is too modern. I'm I'm not going to be able to do this. Shit. So the gang quickly turn on Biggs as his sole responsibility was just to find a train driver that could safely and quickly move the train down the track to the intended spot. And he couldn't even do that. Oh, God. The driver, now with a serious head injury, is threatened to drive the engine and the carriage holding the money down the track. Mm -hmm. The men start to unload the 600-odd sacks of money. Mm -hmm. 600. Whilst 
Uh, Reynolds keeps a close eye on the clock and he's counting down the minutes to how much time they have left. After so many minutes, he calls it. They have to go and they have to go now, which means they have no choice but to leave a number of bags behind. That's just incredible to think that, A, that's 600 sacks of money. Mm. So it is 2.6 million in 600 bags. Yeah. Are these all one pound notes? Well, I guess, I don't think they had 50 pound notes back then. Did they have 20? But they would be like ones, fives, tens, maybe. Yeah, and they must be small bags, I guess. I guess so, like little potato sacks. But yeah, there's about 600 sacks. Reynolds calls time that they need to leave. And as they're collecting the rest of the bags, one of the gang made a significant error, which gives the police their first big clue. Now, the post office staff on the train were threatened not to call the police for at least 30 minutes, as okay. someone would be watching them to make sure they didn't do it. But there's no one watching them, are There's there? no one watching them, though. They always say that, and there's never anyone watching. No. But what do you think the significance is of that? Of what? Being told, oh, don't call anyone for 30 minutes. Well, they're trying to get them to call someone. I don't no. know. What do you mean? Well, they they want they don't want them to call anyone, so they just tell them. Yeah, because, don't call anyone. Well, that means if they don't call the police for at least thirty minutes, that gives them a thirty minute head start mm-hmm. to potentially get to their destination and then hunker down. Okay. So what that does is it gives a police a radius to start their investigation because they're like, well, we only need to look at maybe look at within this area initially of where these people are going to be hiding out. Oh, okay. So the gang escape. Lucky for them. And they're tuning in and they're listening to the police radio airwaves and they head back to the farm where they would do the rest of their hiding out. The gang wake up the next day to news bulletins about the incident and it's everywhere already. But initially there's no threat because the police don't know of their whereabouts. So they pass the time playing Monopoly and hanging out. Now, there are rumours that they played Monopoly with the money that they stole, which I think is hilarious. Amazing. Yes, um, so that's this, how you make Monopoly bearable. I know exactly because I mean, if you're not winning, then you lose interest in Monopoly real quick, right? Mm-hmm. How exciting though, as well. Yeah, but apparently though, that was a rumor about the Monopoly money because I think one of the robbers—I don't know if it was Goody or if it was Biggs—I think they sort of said actually that's a that's just a rumor, which is a shame. But I th- I like to think that they did do that. Oh, so that means that these guys are still alive. We'll come on to that. Okay. okay. <laughs> Sorry, you're you're jumping ahead. You said it from beyond the grave. (laughs) Now, the money um, is stacked from the floor to the ceiling Uh and is divided equally among the main gang. But it doesn't take too long before they learn that the police are looking for the suspects within a 30 mile radius. Mm -hmm. And that spooks the gang as they didn't expect maybe the police to cotton on quite so soon. And they quickly arrange different transport to take them away. They realise that they can't use the same Land Rovers because these vehicles could be identified by the train staff. So that's why they had to arrange for these vehicles to come get them. Yeah, yeah. They wipe down the place to remove any fingerprints or as much evidence that they possibly could do. And they do rush to leave the farm a few days before they're supposed to. This bit hasn't gone to plan. Sure. Now, they were supposed to burn it, but nobody wanted to torch the farm as the risk of being spotted was probably too big. Because if the police are around and you see a massive fire, Mm -hmm. they're probably going to go, what's that? Yeah, for sure. So it doesn't get torched. They all flee and they go their separate ways. But the solicitor, Brian Field, was supposed to arrange for an acquaintance to return to the farm to burn it down and destroy all the evidence. But that guy, he puts his trust in, does a runner. I see. And so Brian tries to assure the rest of the gang that it's fine, it's all sorted out, don't Mm -hmm. worry. They don't buy it. They discover that he's lied and one of the gang, Wilson, has to be restrained as he is ready to kill Brian. Wilson! (laughs) Yeah. Meanwhile, news of the heist captures the collective imagination of the UK. Uh It's all over television and television has actually only just become common in people's homes. Right. And so it was one of the first news stories that people could follow every day and unfold nice. and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah. So people loved it. And the public was kind of divided on whether they thought the robbers were like Robin Hood or because, you know, they're stealing from the Queen and that's kind right. of funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, or actually people that obviously are big royalists are saying, no, that's really bad. You're stealing from the Queen. So, yeah, it was it was divided. However, the police take a very strong stance and they and the post office don't want to be made to look like fools. 
And so they offer a reward of around about £260,000. And what? Th- That's like today's money or 1960s money? That was 1960s money. That's a huge amount. So what would that have been worth today? So 260 was probably worth about $5 million or something like that, maybe. I, That's ridiculous. more than they stole. Well, it was more than people's share of the actual money that they got. <gasps> no! So someone's going to dump them in! Well, this is what they were trying to do. They were trying to get, like, the associates or people oh. in the underworld to kind of come forward and basically reveal information. So, so I they would have had to know what the share was, or was this just like making a, an educated guess? I guess, hypothetically. Well, I mean, they had stories of the postal workers that said that there was between, I don't know, 10 and 15 men. So maybe they could make a bit of a guess if they were dividing sure. it. Sure. Um, but... If someone did come forward, would they have gotten the money then? Or is this just a lie that the police are saying to try to track them out? Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know if anyone did get a reward from it. And it could be a collective pot. It might be that they offered anyone that they could give information. Maybe you'd get 10 grand. So I don't know exactly, but they did put a big prize money to try and get those that might want to like dob in their pals and stuff. Nice. Great. Dobbing in your pals. Always good. I know. So back to the actual crime. Whilst it did come to an abrupt end, the gang thought they did a good job in being pretty discreet. But their comings and goings at a non-working farm didn't go unnoticed by its neighbours. And so the police got several tip-offs, which they kind of ignored initially, but eventually they did go to investigate the farm. The guy that led the investigation, or one of the main men, was a guy called John Woolley of Buckinghamshire Police. Uh, He takes charge and he heads to the farm. And he walks up to the front door of the farm. It's locked. He peers inside. It looks empty. It does look like an abandoned farm. Mm -hmm. He looks around the barns and it it looks unused. There are old machines with cobwebs. Nothing alarmingly wrong. But when he notices something that is out of place, that strikes him as odd. There's two nearly new identical Land Rovers in one of these barns. Now, why would they be there in an abandoned farm? Those are the Land Rovers that they stole from the military base, right? Exactly. And the ones they felt that they couldn't do another getaway in. Because okay. So alarm bells are ringing here. Along with the Land Rovers, they find leftover food, evidence of burnt sacks and bills from the train, and some Scottish money buried in pits that they left behind. Oh, because no one wants the Scottish money. I know. They're like, it's oh, not legal tender. We can't use this. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there could be no mistakes. The robbers were here. Whilst the gang did manage to wipe down a lot of their fingerprints, because they left in such a rush, there were a few that were left behind. Okay. And so these were picked up. And because some of these criminals' fingerprints were already on record because they've done previous crimes, yeah. they could be quickly identified and linked to the robbery. Ooh, which ones? We'll come on to that. Okay. So I feel like I'm saying that a lot, but we will come on to that. It's fine. I'm just eager, you know. Eager uh, beaver. It's good. Eager you're, weasel. It's good. You're interested. I like it. So... Um, the police exploit their contacts to help flush out people they think could be involved. And within a week of the robbery taking place, the police know about 80% of the train robbers, thanks to this evidence that was left behind or those that are willing to grasp. Wow. A pretty quick turnaround. Yeah. Knowing the names of the suspects, though, of one thing, trying to find them, that's going to be another challenge in itself. Uh-huh. However, it doesn't take too long until the police have their first arrest. Now, maybe it's no surprise that the first person they capture is... It's the doofus that was like, couldn't wire the... <laughs> yep, you've got it. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't wire the light. Roger Cordery. <laughs> oh, they got him. Now, he's doing some shifty business around these lock-up garages in Bournemouth. And I think some lady spots him and goes, something's off about you. She calls the police and they pick him up and they bring him back to the station where they interrogate him. And it's during this interrogation that Cordry starts to feel uncomfortable and he's in pain. And he asks if he can go to the toilet to retrieve a key out of his butt. Oh, what's the key for? I'm guessing that's where he's he's hidden the money. So whether it's one of the lockup garages or something else, he's hidden a key up his butt. For a second there, I thought you were correcting me and saying, no, that's where he's hidden the money up his butt. (laughs) That's a lot of money to hide up your butt. Yeah, that's, I don't know. He wanted an equal share as well. He did, yeah. This is how he tried to plan his escape, and it didn't It didn't go down well. Okay, interesting. Following his arrest, a bunch more guys are arrested for having their fingerprints found at the farm. Oh, okay, he didn't dob anyone in then? No, they're quite good about that. I guess also, like, if you are caught, 
And then you dob one of your friends in. And if you're going to go to jail because they understand the magnitude of this crime, then it's not a good look if you're going to jail and then you've dobbed your mates in because then you're going to be like, you're a rat. Yeah, and especially if you want to go back to crime afterwards. Ooh, criminal dynamic. I could totally be a criminal. I've got two keys up my bum. Okay, well, um, there you go, listeners. Um, another example of that is none of the robbers reveals really who hits uh, the train driver over the head. Right. So it's speculated who it could be. And some people have confessed. Why is that? Is that a problem? Well, you could get extra time for being... The one to have hit him on the head. Yeah. We'll come on to what happened to the poor driver. But yeah. Okay, God. So they're able to use the fingerprints found at the farm to detain these people. And because they didn't have an alibi, they could easily arrest them, essentially. Mm -hmm. Now, because some of them were also wanted for other crimes, it was kind of like a huge satisfaction for the police to go, we got you now. Right. So following Cordery's arrest, there's a further nine key members that are captured before December 1963. So within about four or five months, they've got about half of the gang-ish. Wow. Okay. Now, a lot of them were the muscle that were involved, i.e., you know, the ones that were moving the money. Brian Field was also caught, the solicitor. Charles Wilson, the man responsible for dealing out the money, he got captured, mm-hmm. and Goody as well. And so by 1964, 11 men are sentenced, which includes the majority of the gang and some of those involved in the planning stages. Now, as I mentioned, because of the seriousness of the crime and stealing from the Royal Postal Service, some of these men were given 30 years in prison, which was more than what some murderers and armed robbers had received up to this point. Well, yeah, you don't f*** with the Queen and expect to get like, oh, a slap on the wrist. You're You're going down. Do you want to do that without the word? No, no. I want to keep that word in. Yeah, but I've got to edit this. Well, I'm sure you will cope with one little F word. Um, So the justice system wanted to make an example as there was a feeling that they had been humiliated, particularly as some considered these men as heroes, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah, exactly. People were like rooting for them. Yeah, and so they wanted to give them this serious punishment so it deterred people from doing it again. And that shocked even a lot of the British public. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so what year are we at at this point? 1964. 1964. So the following year is when they got sentenced. Sure. But what it also did is that actually, well, some people believe that it led more criminals to use guns because they thought, well, I'm going to get a harsh sentence regardless. I might as well take a gun in. Ah, to set a precedent. Mm. I don't know how true that is, but that's what some people think. Well, I mean, it, it sounds natural, right? Like that's that's naturally what's going to happen if there's if they're being celebrated and they've been successful with it and it's been credited with them having guns, then yeah, just yeah. get an unregistered gun. Yeah, I don't know where I'd find one of them, but yeah, you can get one on Silk Road. Silk Road, no problem. Mm, I'm going to keep off that though. Easy. Oh, people are afraid of the Silk Road, but it's easy to get on. It's easy to buy drugs. It's easy to said enough <laughs> you revealed too much <laughs> revealed too much i'm just kidding um one member of the gang john daly he's acquitted now he didn't mm. feature heavily in our story today but you may recall he was the brother-in-law of reynolds mm-hmm. he is responsible in helping out and being one of the getaway drivers now his fingerprints were found on a monopoly set at the farm which is one of the key evidences found. And I think you can go see this Monopoly set in some museum Shut somewhere. Up, really? Wow. Yeah. Uh, however, he said that because he was related through marriage to Bruce Reynolds, his argument was that, well, I've played Monopoly at his house loads of times. It can't be me. That's just my fingerprints. It just happened to be on there. And that was enough proof to get him off the hook. Really? Interesting. And I would be like, if I was the other robbers that also got pinned because of Monopoly, I'd have gone, I should have used that. Is it too late to use that now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I like that. By the time this trial ends, there are some members on the run still, but a couple more get picked up in 1966. Bruce Reynolds is linked to the robbery through a couple of Monopoly tokens and a Heinz ketchup bottle found at the farm. Mm-hmm. But he manages to avoid capture, living as a fugitive for five years until 1968. Wow. He initially spent six months hiding out, waiting for a passport. Mm -hmm. And apparently he had two friends that would deliver him his shopping requests, which were from Harrods or other fine establishments that would give... 
He's well, living the high life. He's spending that money. Well, he's hiding out. So he needs to find some kind of luxury. Mm-hmm. So he would get crates of champagne delivered to him and he would kind of be imprisoned, but enjoy this new wealth as best he can. Sure. But he was also hiding out with his wife, Franny, at their flat at one point. And Bruce Reynolds narrowly avoids capture because Franny is made aware of police just outside their place. Mm-hmm. She urgently alerts Bruce to go, uh-oh, what are we going to do? What's, why are they here? Um, but a concerned neighbour had noticed a suspicious ladder propped up against their window. Now, I don't know why that ladder was there, whether it was a quick getaway escape, but uh-huh. uh, they perhaps thought maybe someone had burgled their place. Yeah. So I think Franny's upstairs, because it's the first floor flat or whatever, uh, she looks out and the police like, can you come down? And she's like, no, I, I, you know, my husband's not here right now. Can you come back later? I'm a lady unattended. Yeah. You and, can't come here. And they're like, no, we, we need to come in and make sure you're okay. Right. So she goes down and starts to open up the door whilst Reynolds is trapped. There's nowhere to hide in this flat. Mm. Uh, he's in the bedroom and he's, his mind's racing to devise a plan. What is he going to do? hide behind the curtain. Well, is that going to be enough? He's, he's a man on the run. He's wanted by police. Yeah, hide behind the curtain. They'll come in and be like, oh, there's no one in this room. Well, what happens um, as Franny is opening the, the door to the police downstairs, an idea yeah. hits him. Okay. He swiftly gets naked and flings his clothes all around the room. So when the bedroom door opens, Reynolds desperately quickly shields his, his modesty and he reveals that Franny's husband is away on business and he urges the police not to, to do anything and to, to keep their affair a secret. Oh, okay. Interesting. And the police are like, oh, they don't know where to look. They're trying to avoid his eyes. They're kind of embarrassed. They're like, yeah, can you just perhaps get out here and, and you know, get, get on your way sort of thing. And so the police leave, none the wiser. And then the time that they do realize Reynolds has moved on, he's escaped the country and he's on his way to Mexico. Wow. It's very clever. Yeah. I liked his quick thinking there. Yeah, but he has now left his wife. So he's left Franny behind. Well, he goes first and he gets a new identity called Keith Clement. Uh And then his wife changes her name and along with their son, they fly out to join him a little bit later on. And how old is the son at this point? Um... I'm guessing like primary school age. Okay, so he's a young, young kid still. I think so, yeah. Wow. But their money doesn't really last that long. They manage to spend most of it in about three years. And I guess they've been used to the life of luxury with bottles of champagne to now they're eking out a bottle of vodka. Oh, okay. Well, how much was his cut anyway? Do we know? Oh, about, well, the equivalent of four million in today's money. And he spent that all? He spent it all in three years. On champagne and Harrods and... Stop saying that because I've got to cut that out. So <laughs> you have to cut a lot out anyway. Um, yeah, well, they've been living this life of luxury and now it's all been used up. You can't God. put it in banks, can you? No. He, so he's been hiding out in Mexico, uh, but he decides to return to Torquay with only about 3K left in his bank. Okay, well, probably 1960s money. That's quite a lot of money still. Still, I mean, it's a fair amount, but 3K is, uh-huh. you know, that's not... Considering you had 150k, you're now down to three. Sure, um, but he's he's spent his fortune and he's done it pretty fast. He's had a good time. He's back in England and he's picked up by the police pretty quickly. His wife, dad, and stepmother are all arrested, and he's offered a deal to plead guilty. And this is so that they can get him and he would serve 25 years. I see. Um, he didn't really have much choice as otherwise no. his son would be brought up in foster care. Yeah. And so by pleading guilty, his rest of his relatives would, you know, go free. God. So they all knew, I'm assuming. Mm. Wow. They're a poor kid as well. Oh, Nick, his son. Mm. Yeah, well, we'll come on to Nick. Oh, he's, no. He's he got, goes into a life of crime. You no, know, he's got an interesting story, which we'll... Okay. (laughs) Which once again, we'll come on to. (laughs) So Reynolds um, serves 10 years before his release. So he is actually released earlier than what his sentencing was. Sure, good behavior. And to be fair, this kind of happens to a lot of them. They all are released early, but it was just that punishment thing at the time that had to be quite severe. He then ventured into trafficking and money laundering, and that all led to another arrest in 1980 for drug dealing. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't long before he returned to jail. Despite these setbacks, he also penned an autobiography in 1995. Mm-hmm. Um, but in later years, he kind of grappled with his misfortune as he, he couldn't find legal employment and he couldn't find illegal employment, if that makes sense, because he'd draw too much attention because he's quite famous. Yeah, yeah. That meant he would have to rely on income support. And it was in 2013 that he died in his sleep. 
So oh, no. the vibrant life he once led dwindled into this kind of bit of a lackluster existence. Oh. Reynolds himself believed he was plagued by a curse and other members and victims of the heist didn't fare too much better. Mm-hmm. Uh, side note, and a slightly random fact, his son Nick, um, yeah. so he went on to be in a band called Alabama 3, who are best known for one of their songs being the opening credits for The Sopranos. Really? Yeah. So that's Interesting. His. So okay. he, he didn't turn to crime. He found fame a different way. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk through about some of the victims of the crime first off. Sure. The, the, the train driver. Yeah, Mills. Now, he never recovered properly from his injuries. He did go back to work and he suffered headaches for the rest of his life. He died from leukemia seven years later. But it, not as a result, right? Well, his family blame his injury having some impact on the overall quality of his life. And so they argue it was, but then there's been medical people that no. said no, that didn't happen. Yeah, because leukemia is a blood cancer and that normally originates in the bones. Yeah, so that probably, I don't think that caused it, but I think he was a changed man after it. So. Sure. And no one, as I mentioned, admitted to injuring Mills. Um out of this weird loyalty and impact that they had. The co-driver, Dave Whitby, he also was said to never really quite recover in the same way mm-hmm. or wasn't the same again. His sister commented that he was terrified to go back to work after the robbery and he was just 34 years old when he died of a heart attack. Wow. Which his family suspects may have been a result of the trauma he faced. Or, sure. And maybe brought on, you know. Yeah. A commemorative plaque is displayed in Crew Station honouring Jack Mills and David Whitby for their service and most importantly, the bravery in the Great Train Robbery. Wow. As for the rest of the gang, well, Ronald Buster Edwards, he also escaped Mexico, but he ran out of money within a couple of years. So he spent his money quicker than Reynolds. He negotiated his return before being arrested and he served nine years in prison. Mm-hmm. A film based on him and his involvement in the heist was released in 1988 called Buster. Now, Edwards was played by Phil Collins. And one of the soundtrack songs from that movie is Two Hearts. I'm not sure I love Phil Collins. I'm just not sure of Two Hearts. You'll, you'll know Two Hearts. I, do, I can't sing it, but yeah, you'll know it. Edwards would go on to run a flower stall outside Waterloo Station in London before he took his own life in 1994. Then there's Charlie Wilson. He was the man responsible for divvying up the dosh Mm -hmm. and one of the first men to get sentenced originally. He only served four months before he arranged for three men to break him out of prison. He and his wife escaped to Canada and France. However, when his wife called her parents one time, This allowed Scotland Yard to track them down and he was arrested in 1968. So they were surveilling his mum and dad? Yeah, yeah. They keep him close to All that time, wow. Interesting. He served a further 10 years in prison and later in life he moved to Marbella in Spain where he was suspected to be involved with drug smuggling and he was killed by a hitman on his doorstep in 1990. Wow. So didn't, yeah. Them Spanish people. You've got to watch out for them. Met a messy end. Brian Field, uh, he was given a lesser sentence for his involvement in the crime and was released in 1967. Mm -hmm. He didn't get to keep most of his money and two thirds of it was found by hikers in a wood. Did they keep the money or did they report the money to the police? They reported the money to the police. So it was was one of the few bits of money that was found. Wow. Uh, Field also met an early death and was killed with his wife in a car crash in Mm -hmm. 1979 at the age of 44. Right. Goody served about 12 years before release and then went on to lead a quiet life in comparison to others, opening up a bar in Spain. He died from a heart attack in mm-hmm. 2016, but at the age of 86. So oh, he did. Sad. He lived a long life. Yep. 86, good, good running. Yeah. A few others repeated time in prison, traffic drugs. One became a Formula 2 racing driver for a period. Really? Before attempting to kill his father-in-law. Oh, okay, as you do. As you do, it happens. At this point in time, most of the others have either died from an illness or old age. So I think we can kind of say karma perhaps got to some of the robbers, maybe one way or another. Well, most of them lived on old age, so I would say no. Well, uh, yeah, but they didn't necessarily have good luck afterwards. Sure. Their, their life wasn't necessarily the best. 
Mm-hmm. Now, one person we should say, actually, he probably got a good portion of the good karma. So maybe it went to him. Okay. This was Ronnie Biggs. Um, and the he, star of the show. Yeah, he could have a whole podcast to himself. Really? Mm. So he became one of the most famous men involved, despite only playing a small part in the robbery and also messing up. Uh, his life after the heist is even more fascinating. In 1964, he was sentenced to prison along with the other men that were captured at the time. He served 15 months when he also managed to make a, an escape. He scaled the walls of the prison he was held at with a rope ladder before dropping on to a waiting removal fan. Wow. He then fled to Brussels by boat where he sent his wife a note to join him in Paris. It's okay. Quite, quite romantic. That is where he gets... Not if you're on the run. Well, I don't know. It's kind of thrilling, I guess. Yeah. Come join me in Paris. Sure. We'll get a baguette. Uh- um. But that's where he gets some new identity papers. Okay. He also undergoes plastic surgery to change the shape of his face to match his new identity. Wow. Uh, This reportedly cost him 40 grand. So about a third of his money that he's got, he spent on a new face. From 1960s money? Yeah. Wow. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, And then... And does he look significantly different? um, When I've looked at pictures, maybe slightly different jaw, nose is maybe a bit different. I mean... Enough, probably, for maybe that if you glance, you wouldn't. But if you looked at him close enough, you're like, no, that is the same person. I'd be like, hang on a minute. I don't look like Mike Tyson. <laughs> I paid 40 grand for this. I wanted Mike Tyson. <laughs> this is, and maybe plastic surgery back then just wasn't all that. I don't no, know. No, probably not. Yeah. You wouldn't look like, what's her face? Sharon. Sharon Osborne? Yeah. Has she had a load of plastic surgery? Well, if you look at her when she starts the X Factor versus now, She's like de-aged about 30 years. Oh, she's de-aged. So she's done it well? Is that what you're implying? I mean, she has a good... If I was going to get plastic surgery, I would want her contacts. Hang on. I, in relation to Sharon Osbourne, mm-hmm. I just have to say, how, how, how <laughs> is Ozzy Osbourne still alive? Um, I don't know. Maybe he's, she, he's barely alive. She puts him in pickle at night. I don't know. It's crazy. Yeah. Like he's just, he's blatantly got like some kind of Parkinson's or something mm. shaking away. Poor old Really, drugs. real bad nerve damage. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Did you know that he didn't realize? Yes. Yes, I did know. Oh. Hang on. Say, <laughs> say it for the listeners. <laughs> yeah. Did you know? So he's famous for biting off the head of a bat, isn't he? Yes, on stage. On stage. But apparently he didn't realise that that was a bat, or at least a live one, wasn't it? He didn't know it was a live bat. He thought it was a a plastic bat yeah. that someone had bought at like the merch store. And just chucked it on stage. And chucked it on stage and he bit it off. So was he didn't bring the bat. So that means that some little toe rag had brought a bat into the concert and chucked that on was stage. That an open concert and it just flew down? I don't know. Oh, do you think? Oh, is that what that was then? Could yeah. be. Poor Bat. Yeah, that is poor Bat. Um, so Biggs, he spent 40 grand on plastic surgery. Looks a bit different. Um, but in 1966, Biggs and his family then flee to Sydney. And that costs him a further 55 grand. So with the legal expenses and everything else that he's, you know, new face, he's only got about seven grand remaining from his 140k share originally. But why does it cost 55 grand to go all the way to Australia? Private jets, papers, other people you've got to pay off to sneak into the border. Right, he probably didn't need half of those things. Well, I don't know. I've never escaped the law. What? These criminals, when you steal money, you need to make sure that you... You put the money to work, mm. right? Earn some massive income, set up a business, you know, invest the money into stocks and shares. Otherwise, you end up with nothing. Well, the thing is they can't use that money anywhere. So they're just holding on to it and just spending it. But anyway. So he- what, what does that mean? They Using it is spending it. Well, what I mean is they can't put it into a bank. They can't go buy a house and stuff with that money. Yeah, but they could, they could money launder it. Well, some of them do, um, but these guys don't. Well, right. perhaps they do, but they spent so much money in escaping that they don't have much left. Right. Um, so it kind of doesn't seem like for him and also for Reynolds, is this hardly worth it? Mm. But whilst in Australia, Biggs faces a constant threat of being found out. So he receives anonymous letters telling him Interpol was after him. Uh, and that persuades him to then move to Melbourne. 
And he then gets an altered passport of a friend to escape on a ship to Panama Mm -hmm. and then later Brazil. And he leaves his wife and his children behind. They always go to Brazil. Like the guys who did the great escape from Alcatraz, they're rumored to have gone to Brazil. Well, there's a good reason for that. Well, it's particularly for Biggs. Um, Because as it happens, Brazil doesn't have an extradition or it didn't have an extradition Mm. treaty with the UK at the time. Wow. And so that meant Biggs could remain in Brazil for years as a free man. Wow. That's why they all go to Brazil then. Yeah. Okay. Um, But so he still attracted a lot of interest, though, from the media attention. Mm -hmm. uh, Because I think people knew he was in Brazil, but they couldn't necessarily do anything about it. Um, I think the Daily Express, there was a reporter there that actually found him and broke that news story. Mm-hmm. Um, but at this point, he had become a father to a Brazilian woman. And under Brazilian law, that gave him protection of being shipped back to the UK. Right. However, this didn't mean he had a total easy life. He was a known criminal, so he couldn't easily work or visit bars. Um, and he had to be home, I think, or couldn't be away from home after 10pm. So I think there were still limitations on what he can do. Mm-hmm. Uh, to generate an income, him and his family would host barbecues at their home and tourists could come meet him and hear stories of the robbery. What? So kind of local celebrity. Yeah, he's capitalizing on it. Is he uh, selling like little photographs of like what the Star Trek people do when you go to a convention? Maybe. Maybe he has a whole batch printed that he signs. And yeah. Like, oh, this well, is- that's that's one pound or the equivalent of... Brazilian Reyes. Or what, yeah. That's what it is, yeah. Um, and so trying to make some more money, he went on to record the vocals on two songs Shut up. released by the Sex Pistols. Really? One of which was called No One Is Innocent in 1978. Uh-huh. In 1981, Biggs was then kidnapped by a British gang of ex-soldiers. For what? Well, there's a rumour that maybe these... They were pissed off about the Land Rovers. <laughs> potentially. Or they were maybe somehow uh, paid by police in the uk to go do this or something like i don't know some secret deal okay um but luck was on biggs's side as the boat that they were on board suffered mechanical problems off the coast of barbados okay and it meant that they all had to be rescued by the barbados coast guard oh no so uh the ex-soldiers had hoped that they could collect a reward from the police Uh but like brazil barbados had no extradition treaty and they couldn't basically send him back And after some time in Barbados prison, Biggs was allowed to go free and go back to Brazil. This, of course, garnered more media attention and Biggs carried out an interview with the press. And the kidnapping and Scotland Yard's attempts to bring him back to the UK inspired a film called Prisoner of Rio. And that was released in 1988 and was also co-written by Biggs himself. Okay, so he had a hand in it. So it was very... Writes the theme tune, sing the theme tune, that kind of thing. Um, Biggs then went on to record the vocals for more songs, including a German rock band. Wow, so he's really musical. I guess he's so. really into his uh, his music, yeah. I don't know if he's good at it, but I need to listen to one of his songs. Well, I mean, these are big bands, right? Yeah. Sex Pistols are huge. Yeah. In 1997, despite the UK and Brazil coming up with a new extradition treaty, the UK filled a request to have Biggs return to the UK the Brazilian Supreme Court rejected this and gave Biggs the right to live a free man in Brazil for the rest of his life. Wow. Because the crime that he committed was like 20... so long ago. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like the equivalent of like statutes of limitation in America where, oh, so much time has gone by. It's no longer a problem anymore. Yeah. It's kind of like, this isn't... Why is this even new? That was 1960s money. It's nothing now. Too late. Yeah. But eventually, Biggs decides to give it all up and is willing to come back to the UK. So in 2001, almost 40 years after being on the run, Mm -hmm. he gets a private jet, which is paid for by The Sun. That's a tabloid newspaper in the UK, for those who don't know. What year is this? In 2001. Wow. And and that's in return for an exclusive story back in the UK. But as soon as he arrives, he's arrested and he's put back in prison. Wow. So why did he do this and give up his freedom? Because he had cancer and he needed... Medical treatment. Well, some think that's the real reason. But what he says is that he had an overwhelming desire to walk into a Margate pub as an Englishman and buy a pint of bitter. But he got arrested. Did he get their chance to do that? I don't know. Is he still in prison now? Well, whilst in prison, his health deteriorates. He files for early release several times, but this is denied. He was actually even moved to a prison here in Norwich. 
And by shut up, yeah. And by two thousand and nine, Norwich on Mousehold. I guess is that one, unless it was another one. See, I thought. Do you know what? In the back of my mind, somewhere, when you were saying the name at the very beginning, maybe there was something there with the kind of famous prisoners that were in Norwich. Well, yeah, he is one of the most famous prisoners and one of the most famous criminals in UK history. But he served time potentially in Norwich. Interesting. Anyway, so by two thousand and nine. After eight years, he was eventually granted release, where he spent a lot of the remaining time in hospitals and care homes. In 2013, at the age of 84, Biggs dies at a care home in North London, just a few hours before another television adaptation airs on the UK TV about the robbery. Wow. And finally, that leads us on to those that never got caught. There were about, well, we think there's five in total. Mm Mm-hmm. There were three that were never officially named, but have been rumoured to be involved. No one gave their names up at the time. And so their names have been revealed, could be like a pseudonym or perhaps a slightly different cover name. One man is rumoured to go by the name Bill Jennings. He kept himself to himself and a lot of the gang perhaps didn't even know his real name. He was thought to be connected, but the police found no evidence he was there at the farm. It's thought his real name was Harry Smith, and he was fortunate enough to spend his wealth on 28 properties. So he did invest. Yes. Uh, a hotel and a bar in Portsmouth before his death. See, people, you got to be smart. Be more like Harry Smith, mm. if that is indeed his name. Then there was Frank Monroe, a.k.a. Danny Pembroke. He had his house searched by police, but supposedly was very careful and wore gloves the entire time that he was at the farm. So they couldn't really pin anything on him. Mm-hmm. After his death, his son admitted to his involvement in the case. Now, the third guy, who was never officially confirmed, is thought to be someone called Billy Ambrose, a club owner and East End criminal who had previously spent time in prison for fraud and robbery. Mm -hmm. Descriptions from witnesses around the time match his appearance, but he died in 2009, and we may never know if he was involved. Wow. Then, of course, there was Pop, that Mm -hmm. unreliable replacement train driver. Um, So his identity has never been revealed. But an author writing a book on the robbery hired a detective agency that manages to track down the driver and his wife. It is said that the driver had gone senile by this point and is cared for by his wife. And she admits that she burnt his clothes that evening that he was wearing and was on the edge that the gang members would come discover them and Mm. murder him or the police would arrest him. And so the author agreed to keep their identity hidden. And to this day, we don't know who he really is. Wow. And lastly, one of the greatest enigmas that surrounds this is the identity of the Ulsterman, the individual who initially involved the gang in the heist. So who do they think he was? Well, early on, police speculated that the Ulsterman could have been an insider from the post office. Yeah. As the circumstances of reduced security and abundance of money on that specific night in August 1963 seemed beyond just mere chance. Goody unveiled a potential candidate named Patrick McKenna, a Belfast-born postal worker that was Uh residing in Islington. During a summer plotting session, the Ulsterman dropped his sunglasses, or maybe just his regular glasses, which Goody retrieved and noticed the name was inscribed within the case. Surprisingly, though, McKenna's surviving family never suspected him. And they said, like, he didn't have a car, he didn't lead an extravagant lifestyle, so upon his passing, he only left behind three grand. What did you do with the money? Well, people think, well, was it stolen or could he perhaps given it away or was he even involved? No one actually knows. Wow. That's the biggest mystery. That's what this podcast should have been about. (laughs) Well, I think it's the whole thing, isn't it? The whole story is fascinating. I'm just teasing you. But regardless, an air of mystery continues to shroud the case. Consequently, the true identity of the Ulsterman may forever be unknown. Now, 60 years later, there's still a lot of fascination and interest with the story, particularly because numerous mysteries remain unresolved, leaving the possibility of new evidence emerging on its anniversary. Great. So I guess that brings us to an end of another episode of The Compendium, an assembly of fascinating and intriguing things. We hope you enjoyed our dabble in today's story. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Adam. You're welcome. And if you also enjoyed it, then please subscribe and leave us a cheeky five-star review. And why not schedule episodes to download so you never miss a moment of intrigue with us. Doing so really helps us grow our show so we can continue to deliver even more compelling stories to you each week. We'd also love to connect with you beyond the podcast. You can follow us on Instagram at The Compendium Podcast for sneak peeks, behind the scenes content and more. Or if you've got a burning question or a comment or even a suggestion for a future episode, then you can drop us an email at thecompendiumpod at gmail.com. We really do love hearing from you, don't we, Adam? We do indeed. So we release every Tuesday. So join us next week as we unravel another intriguing story from the world of the fascinating. So until then, stay curious. See ya. See ya.